Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this busy season. Today, we'll be giving you an update on CHS and our businesses based on our second quarter results. Uh, so six months through the year and, and a little bit of a look at current conditions. And boy, there's a lot going on. Uh, we also want to have a chance to hear from you. Uh, on the screen, you'll see how to submit a question by email or text message, the same ways that we've used in the past, so nothing new in that front, but encourage you to send messages in or questions in uh, throughout this meeting, and we'll get to them at the, at, at the end. Let's begin by hearing from uh, the board chair, Dan Schur. Thank you, Jay, and, and welcome to the CHS Owners Forum. Uh, this is just one of several that we're going to have this year. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I, I thank you for joining us today. Now, this is a, an early forum that we're having because we wanted to communicate to you about some of the things that are going on at CHS and some of the exciting transformational uh, projects that we have in place. So I think you'll, I hope you look forward to that. The purpose is uh, still the same as it has always been for our owners' forums. It's to, trans, uh, uh, to communicate with you with candor, with transparency, and then, and then for us to listen and to hear your thoughts and concerns. Now, throughout this uh, pandemic, our role as board and management really uh, has not changed. The way we do it maybe has changed, but the, the responsibilities are still the same. And with our responsibilities as board, part of it is, is oversight. And we have uh, categories of oversight that you might think about uh, finance and then risk, balance sheet management and capital and then governance. And we continue to do that on a yearly basis. That's part of our role as a board member. Uh, as you think about the things like balance sheet management capital, uh, the board has to step back and look at the, the value statement that we are creating for our owners. And that can include a lot of things. Uh, for instance, uh, some assets, products and services, information, as you see behind us, technology and the use of, of uh, advice. All of that are, are key components of a value statement that we're creating, but it also includes a strong balance sheet so that we can uh, look at opportunities when we see opportunities that we think are in the best interest of you on the long haul. And it also includes patronage and uh, redemption of equity. All of that together, a value statement uh, that we have to balance because all of those take resources and limited, we have a limited supply of resources. So we look at that every year as a board and, and try to make that proper balance. The Governance Committee is also uh, going to all work on, on refreshing our, our look at governance and included in that is our uh, bylaw amendment that we, we talked about last year at this time with you. And this bylaw amendment is a simple bylaw amendment that uh, refreshes the look of our bylaws, uh, takes away some outdated language of things that we no longer use at CHS. And then specifically, uh, we're looking at trying to refresh and verify that the online voting process is, the current, uh, is current and an appropriate process that we can use for CHS. Now, I characterize this as it's just a simple bylaw amendment we take this very seriously. So we'll continue to communicate with you throughout the year about this and you'll look for it. Uh, it's on the website at CHS. It is on, uh, it, we will continue to communicate to you with emails and then more informational meetings. So if you have concerns or thoughts that you can get back to us and we certainly will uh, we'll look at that uh, and, and, and communicate with you. If you have any questions or concerns uh, as we go through this process, please contact me or one of our board members. We'd be glad to, to help you through the process. There, another part of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, role of a board is strategy and working with management on strategy and looking at that long term. This is really an exciting part of, of our, our process. And Jay's going to talk to you a little later about the four strategies that we have in place. But uh, we've talked to you about this before at the last few meetings at, a, at a, bigger, a bigger and a broader look. It's about rethinking the way we go to the market, rethinking how we work as a company to streamline this supply chain, streamline the information flow to make us more efficient and, and provide greater value to you as an owner. Now, we've had these strategies in place, but we're now we're seeing this come to fruition, and it's really exciting. I, I just think it's really a great... Uh, testament to the work being done in the background and uh, the board is excited about it. I think you're going to be very pleased with some of the things that you're going to hear today and in the future coming up. Now Jay, I'm going to turn it over to you, but before 
I do that. I just wanted to, to thank you and uh, the rest of the team, all the CHS employees, for just some great work of putting out this hard work. It's not, this isn't flashy assets that we're buying. This is just hard work rethinking our future CHS strategy. And I thank you for putting those pieces together. Jay? Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> So now we'll provide an update on the company for the first half of 2021 and as we move into the third quarter and how we're looking at the outlook for the year. Uh, we want to share how we're doing against the strategies that Dan outlined in this unique, important uh, year. You're also going to hear from our chief financial officer, Olivia Nelligan, uh, on details around our financial performance, both within the quarter and, and year to date. And then uh, we'll have the panel of some of the CHS uh, business leaders look at their performance and their outlook for, for the year. And then, and then we'll open it all up uh, to questions late, late in the meeting. First, remember that uh, some of what we share today could be considered forward looking. Uh, some of the actual events may differ from what we talk about today. So it's April 22, it, it's Earth Day. Happy Earth Day to, to everyone. Uh, just speaking along those lines, really a strong start to the growing season, really a lot of optimism uh, across agriculture and, uh, and people that own us deserve it because it's been a tough couple of years and we're really seeing commodities in this morning included uh, really uh, drive, uh, drive forward. Um, you know, the spring itself looked to be an early start, but increasingly looks a little bit more like a normal start, but it, it really looks to be a good spring. We had a nice fall, particularly from a fertilizer uh, aspect, and, and the spring is opening up ex extremely strong as well. P commodity prices are good, um, you know, low grain stocks, or at least the market's estimation of, of low grain stocks is helping raise the floor on prices and, and signal the need for a big crop uh, this year, and, uh, and, and fortunately for CHS and our local cooperatives, that's right up our alley. Uh, we'll be all over that and all ready for that. Uh, we are watching with some concern um, some of the dry conditions in the western half of our, of our trade territory. Um, and as we look at some of the, you know, the pandemic of impacts that really were significant in energy in the first half of this year and the last half of last year, there, there really is some nice momentum, particularly in our premium diesel fuel sales that, uh, that, that is really tied to the crop going in and, and our performance uh, so far this year. So we can look across the platform and really see reason for optimism uh, as we progress through the year. It doesn't take anything away from that. It's been a tough, tough year, tough first half of the year, but we really looking forward in a, in a, in a much more optimistic way as we see these, the, the things, good things going on in agriculture and the good things going, you know, that we're starting to see in the world in terms of coming out of, uh, coming out of the pandemic. Um, you know, it was, as we think about global energy demands, there, you know, there still is impact from the pandemic about that, but each month we're starting to see those demands step up uh, globally, uh, across the United States, just nice increases. In fact, even now starting to see it in airline travel. Uh, so all of those things that we're actually seeing as opposed to hoping for, uh, building, that, building that momentum. Uh, refining margins, we, we refer to them as crack spreads, um, really have, have improved considerably uh, over earlier this year and the last half of last year. Now we have ways to go, but we're just seeing nice steady improvement uh, within you know, our energy, energy segment, which really took the impacts of the pandemic probably the hardest of any part, uh, part of the company. And finally, you know, we're just uh, good to see the progress around vaccinations because really that's, that's what's allowing you know, all, all of the things I spoke about you know, to gain momentum and keep going forward is the fact that people are getting out more, they're traveling more, their life is steadily returning to, uh, to the way we knew it. Uh, so four strategies, four strategies that we operate under. One, to create an experience that makes CHS your first choice. Two, growing our market access. Three, evolving our core businesses for the world that we have, not the world we thought. Uh, and four, to transform the business to unleash the enterprise. Today, I want to focus just a little bit on how we're transforming CHS. Dan spoke a, a bit to it, to better serve your needs and to improve your experience so CHS is your first choice. Today, um, we're broadcasting from the Global Grain and Processing Trading Floor in the Invergrove Heights uh, office building. Behind me, you see screens that bring our digital supply chain to life. 
it's really a combination of technology and data that helps drive our strategies. And it's targeted at two things. One, leveraging the data for better decision making, to make better decisions as a company that, that uses what we have and uses the data we have and collects it and, and, and provides the people that we work with and our customers and our local cooperatives to also get insight into that data for them to make better decisions. And second, making it easier to do business with CHS. That's it, those two things. So how we're going about it is we're digitizing the supply chain. Digitizing, I mean, that's a fancy way of saying we're compiling and analyzing data from throughout the system, farmers, local cooperatives, customers around the world, to give us end-to-end -end visibility. So what do we do with that visibility? Well, what we do with it is we have now better transparency and greater access to what's happening around the world. This makes us a better company, and being better is a key imperative to making CHS your first choice. The strategies fit together. It's transforming for this purpose, and it's to create an environment where we can be a first choice. So adding pre predictive information about weather and markets means we can anticipate and we can act more effectively. Artificial intelligence makes us even more agile so we can roll through the demand shocks and other disruptions. Doesn't make it easy, doesn't even take them away. Gives you a better line of sight to what's coming. And we're partnering with some of the best in the business, Microsoft, SAP, Gartner, to ensure that we have the right tools and the right platforms to maintain a competitive advantage. So let me talk about a few examples. We're constantly pulling data from ships that are moving around the world and rail cars throughout the US. We know where the loads are, if they're on time, and what might kind of affect their arrival at destinations. All of that makes us better able to optimize the supply chain and have assets prepared to receive. Sensors in grain loads indicates the conditions that they are experiencing so we can be aware of any impacts to quality that it could affect value for those buyers. And when we think about information inside the supply chain, we have 15,000 cameras and data capturing devices at terminal and port facilities from Superior, Wisconsin to Myrtle Grove, from Tempco out in the PNW to the West Coast, to the Midwest and, and river terminals that we can see real time what's happening at those facilities and combine that with the data from each site to track loading and unloading activity. That means we can adjust quickly to shift fertilizer delivery or to communicate with co-ops and farmers about windows in grain delivery to be a better company. Real-time scale data at river terminals also means we can share wait times, wait times, so that we can, you know, hopefully avoid people standing or sitting in line to unload. We're mapping our trade territory with GIS technology, layering on market share information, historical crop yields, USDA, USDA information, and weather data to gauge our input needs and our grain production. This helps us anticipate, and it helps us grow in our agronomy, in our energy, in our grains business, and establish grain marketing options to move the crop to customers around the world. Because those customers around the world, we wanna be their first choice too. So all of these steps allows us to be a better supplier to those customers and be a supplier that's owned by local cooperatives and farmers. A really big deal to customers around the world. Now on the farm, my CHS puts data to help you make decisions in the palm of your hand. From markets to, and their updates that go to the markets on your orders and on your grain deliveries. And now you can even improve and pay CHS invoices through my CHS through the phone on your hand. In our energy business, we use predictive analytics to constantly update our weather-based demand models for say a product like number one that during the winter is always a headache. But how can we apply data to do a better job? And many of you use our automated fuel delivery system which continues to use tank monitors to alert distribution centers ahead, not when they're empty, but ahead to refill tanks and routing systems that improve efficiency. 
This technology, while it's been around for 20 years, continues to advance to bring additional efficiency to the supply chain and making doing business with CHS and local cooperatives easier. And it also helps tie that customer closer to the local cooperative. So the bottom line is this is not technology for technology's sake. This isn't about shiny pennies or isn't this nice seeing screens. We are hard at work at creating a stronger CHS to gain market share and to serve our owners. And we're doing it by adding ways to make it easier for you to do business with us. That's what we're after. And it's a journey. There's a lot more to do. We are a long ways from done, but we are really happy with progress to date and can't wait for more and more opportunities when we're back in person to show you this, uh, for people to be back in, in your offices, being able to show you this and how we can do this together. Um, just, just, just a lot of good work going underneath it and I'm really excited uh, about it. And, and you combine that with just business conditions that are getting increasingly better uh, all the way across CHS. Uh, it, it, it looks to be just a lot to be excited about. Just a couple of quick updates I just want to also pass on to you. Uh, you, you. Most of you know that we are doing an expansion at our Fairmont, Minnesota soybean crushing facility. Uh, really is nice timing to be doing an expansion. We look to bring that up uh, in August, which is going to increase capacity by about 30%. Really nice time to have additional crush capacity for bushels uh, of beans that our owners grow and serving into a market that's awful hungry for soybean products. Uh, the board of directors at their April meeting uh, approved an expansion to our Myrtle Grove, Louisiana grain export facility. Uh, we'll add about 75 million bushels of capacity, about a 30% increase. Uh, we're just beginning that project, look to be done in about 2023. Uh, really excited about that. Just gives us more homes for bushels of grain that, that our owners grow uh, that are targeted at, 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 at the Gulf Coast. The refined fuels area has just got a lot of momentum uh, um, to refresh the Senex brand with the lift program. Uh, it, it really is updates exterior and interior um, appearances for consumers. And we just, we just know that's, we're going to be in that business. We got to do that because the consumer needs to see facilities that are fresh and bright and, uh, and energy just is getting a lot of momentum <clears throat> about that offering uh, to, our, to, our, to our owners. And, and in agronomy, um, just tremendous work going on around serving this strong fertilizer season that started last fall and is continuing this spring. Uh, just a lot of nice momentum uh, that we're that, that we're seeing, and you know, frankly, being open up, being able to open up the spring in in much more normal conditions is helping. Um, but supply is ready. I'm really, really happy with the growth that we have seen in our crop protection products business um, when we acquired the remainder part of, of of the previous West Central organization. Just really nice growth that we've seen since that acquisition was done, and and thank you all for your for your growing business with us in, in, in that in that important part of our platform. Also, want to just make also a point around uh, our, our, our our value around cooperative spirit, uh, and that goes to community support. CHS Community Giving and the CHS Foundation continue providing support for rural communities, for egg education, and for safety. The Seeds for Stewardship Matching Grants Program just completed another round of grant selection that awarded about 47 grants, totaling about $165,000. We'll have another round starting on May 1st, so if you are making contributions, make sure you, uh, you, you do submissions uh, for those. We made a large uh, gift to Agra Safe uh, to support mental health training, safety training uh, for young producers, and continuing education for rural nurses. And then I also really want to uh, call out all the people that had a lot to do with the Harvest for Hunger um, campaign that we run each year. That campaign raised this year $500,000. Um, and that came from a lot of sources, uh, producers, um, bake sales, uh, a company match that we make uh, to it, but $500,000 that's dedicated to food banks in rural areas, to food banks in rural areas. And it's, it's a big deal across those communities that, that $500,000 going to those, those food banks. So last, I'd like to invite 
uh, you to attend our in-person owners forums this summer, as Dan mentioned. Our intent today is, is to return to in-person uh, meetings at five locations uh, this summer. Plus, we'll have a virtual forum like this for those that, that, that can't be at it. Uh, watch for details. Look forward to being in person uh, with you and uh, really just have, have a great, I don't know, I'm looking forward to being back out, frankly. Uh, it's, it's time. And, uh, and for the staff, they want to be back out. It's, it's time. So we're really hoping we can do that uh, come this, this summer and we're aiming to do that. So with that, um, I'm going to ask Olivia Nelligan to come up and give us a recap of the last quarter and the uh, entire first half of fiscal uh, 2021. Olivia? Thank you, Jay. Well, as Jay said, this is our financial update for the second quarter and the first half of fiscal year 2021. And while this owner's forum needs to be virtual, I look forward to meeting many of you in person later this summer. What you see on this slide is a summary view of net income by business segment for the second quarter of 2021, which is the three months ending at the end of February. Let's start with our energy segment. For the quarter, our energy business had a net loss of 54.6 million versus net income last year of 138.9 million, an adverse change of 193.6 million. The profitability of our energy segment is largely driven by crack spreads and crude oil differentials. These spreads are driven by refined fuel product supply and demand. Global demand suppression since March 2020 resulting from the pandemic has continued to adversely impact margins. We also saw ex exceptionally high costs in comparison with last year for renewable energy credits or RINs, which we are required to purchase under the renewable fuel standard. And this has also negatively impacted our profitability. Additionally, our propane business saw decreased volumes due to warmer winter weather in comparison with 2020. The ag segment generated net income of 14 million in the second quarter versus a net loss of 20.8 million in the prior year. So a positive change year over year for the quarter of 34.8 million. This significantly improved earnings performance was driven by a number of factors, including favorable spring weather, which drove increased demand for crop inputs, feed and farm supplies, increased margins for some agricultural products, including processing and food ingredients process products with strength in soybean crush markets, and continued strong demand from export grain markets, including China. We also saw increased equity income from our investment in Temco in the Pacific Northwest. Our nitrogen production segment had net income of 11.1 million versus prior year of 5.7 million. So a positive year over year change for the quarter of 5.4 million. This was primarily as a result of increased urea sales prices. Our corporate and other category reported net income of 22.7 million versus prior year of 4 million. So a positive change of 18.7 million year over year for the quarter. As a reminder, this category includes CHS Hedging, CHS Capital, and our joint ec venture equity investments in both Ardent Mills, a leading flour supplier, and Ventura Foods, a producer of edible oil-based branded and private label food products. And it also includes our corporate function costs. We saw increased equity income from Ardent Mills due to increased demand for flour, and a significant portion of the positive change year over year was attributable to decreased marketing, administrative and general costs within our corporate functions as a result of focused cost reduction initiatives. We will be pushing out these cost savings from the corporate category into the businesses at the end of the year for the purposes of patronage calculations. In total, we saw a pre-tax net loss of 6.6 .6 million compared with pre-tax income of 127.8 million in the prior year, an adverse change of 134.5 million. In Q2 of fiscal 2021, we have an income tax expense of 31.6 million compared with an income tax benefit in Q1. Increased income tax expense during Q2 over Q1 reflected changes in the mix and amount of full year earnings projected across our business units and our equity management assumptions. 
our total net loss for the quarter was 38.2 million versus a prior year net income of 125.4 million, so an adverse change of 163.6 million. In looking at our net income for the six months ended in February 2021, it's a similar story. Our energy segment made a net loss of 121.8 million versus a prior year net income of 301 million. So a year over year adverse change of 422.9 million. Again, the pandemic really adver adversely impacting margins and RINs prices hurting profitability in the amount of 63 million in the first six months. Of note in energy is that the Q2 results improved over Q1 and we enter into the second half of the year with more optimism given improved market fundamentals and at least at this stage indications of improved crack spreads. Our ag segment had net income of 97 million versus the prior year of a net loss of 34.7 million. So a positive change year over year of 131.7 million for the first half of the year. We're very pleased with this performance and we know our teams, supply chain and businesses are positioned to continue to capture value for our owners in this strong ag economy. Our nitrogen production segment had net income of 15.6 million versus 22.1 million in the prior year in the first half, which is an adverse change of 6.5 million. The de this decrease in net income is due to lower equity method income attributed to reduced sales prices of UAN and increased natural gas costs, which were partially offset by increased sale prices of urea. The corporate and other category reported net income of 47.5 million versus prior year net income of 24.6 million. So a positive change of 22.8 million year over year. Pre-tax income was 38.3 million versus prior year of 313.2 million and adverse change of 274.8 million. Our income tax expense for the first six months was 7.3 million versus 8.7 million in the prior year. Our net income for the first six months was 31.4 million versus a prior year net income of 303.3 million, a net change of 271.8 million. You may recall when we spoke at the annual meeting in December that we were anticipating a challenging year ahead given what we knew at that stage about the market environment and the uncertainty caused by the pandemic, especially in light of the headwinds facing the entire refined fuels industry. Unfortunately, we've been proven right about that, but we took decisive action at the start of this fiscal year to protect our financial health and to ensure we can maintain a strong balance sheet even through tougher times. I am happy to report that our focused efforts to reduce budgeted costs this year have been very effective across all of our businesses. But we know that you cannot cut your way to prosperity. It's not a sustainable tactic. We need to continue to invest in our businesses to stay competitive and strong into the future. That's why cutting costs is not the only thing that we did. We also set in motion plans to optimize our cash flows and reduce our cash conversion cycle. Through the focus and dedication of our teams, we are also seeing great progress in this area. And this has been particularly important at a time of increased commodity prices. Finally, as Jay said, we continue to advance our thinking and planning on the CHS operating model and how we can conduct business in the most effective, efficient way possible better leveraging our size and scale and setting up our supply chains to be more agile and connected to better serve you, our owners. There is significant work ahead, but given a very tough energy industry environment for the first six months, I'm very proud of the work of the teams and our progress for the first six months of fiscal 2021. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Olivia. Let me uh, just begin now with, uh, with being able to hear from the uh, business leaders. There's about four of them lined up here, looking as good as they can, I guess. Uh, then uh, we have John Griffith, who leads our global grain marketing and uh, processing and our hedging uh, platform. Uh, Gary Halverson, who leads our agronomy business, uh, both in, in crop protection as well as uh, crop nutrients. Darren Hunhoff 
leading uh, energy and, uh, and our cooperative resources group, and uh, Rick Dusick, uh, who leads our country operations uh, area. So I'm just gonna let them pass down the road, but, but really if you could address for, for our audience a little bit, how you see business today, and also kind of an outlook that you're operating under uh, going, going forward. John Griffith, uh, I think we'll, we'll start with you and, uh, and just a tremendous amount going on in your business and, and really, you know, so drastically different from what, you know, circumstances you and our owners have felt over the last few years. Uh, some of it just really nice to see and some of it which might drive some behavior that gives us some pause too. But with that, maybe I'll turn it to you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great pleasure to be with you here today, and, and as Jay said, you know, it's been an exciting uh, crop year. Started, you know, well before harvest and has continued all the way through with volume and escalation of price and, and of course, you know, profitability that comes with this exciting time. So I think it's been good for everyone um, and continues to be, and I want to talk to you a, a little bit about that uh, looking forward as well. You know, as Jay said, uh, we're using technology and data to really connect and visualize our supply chain and bring real-time information. All of that really translates to us in speed and quality of decision-making. And when we can make decisions with better information, faster, um, it allows us to serve our customers and react to the markets and capture market share. And that's exactly what we've done. When we've combined that with our lean principles and philosophies uh, in our operations and in every aspect of our business, basically, to improve our efficiencies and remove waste, um, we've seen instances where we've improved uh, operations by 20%. So we're doing more with the same, growing our business, handling more grain, doing it uh, more efficiently on behalf of our owners without making any uh, brick and mortar investments. So that's really an exciting way to, to add to our, our business. Um, you know, as Jay said, from the, from the brick and mortar perspective, we do have a, a project in our soybean crushing business uh, in flight. And, you know, it's really exciting that we're gonna be done with that project uh, at the end of July, and we'll be able to catch this, this market that has been driven by renewable diesel uh, demand for, for soy oil and has really you know, increased the soy uh, crush margins you know, using the, uh, the, the oil share of that, uh, that crush margin has been just unheard of levels, with unprecedented levels uh, of prices for oil. And, and we see that you know, with lots of investments. I'm sure you've read many things yourselves about that and, and that looks like it could continue for some time. So that gives us some real optimism going, f going forward and we're really happy that we're gonna be completing that, uh, that capital project in a timely fashion. Um, you know, we've been working uh, on our market access for a couple of years and we're really proud of the demand that we can secure all over the world for all, on behalf of all of you. And now it's time to increase the capacity of Myrtle Grove in order to pull that through and bring it all the way back into the interior and, and, and support the grain supply chain. And that's going to be a really exciting project in, in, one of the, in the largest export corridor um, in the world. Um, and that's going to give us you know, some great opportunities to connect all the way back to uh, your production and bring it around the world. Um, you know, the markets have been uh, you know, doing really well on, on the on the backs of China buying uh, a lot of corn and soybeans this year, um, you know, particularly corn. Uh, you know, last year, uh, China bought basically no corn out of the U.S. This year, they're, they're going to exceed 25 million metric tons. Um, that's just an incredible increase. They'll be the largest uh, buyer of corn uh, from the U.S. by, by double. Um, and it used to be Mexico at about 11 million tons. So you can see the, the dramatic impact that that has. We think that's going to continue. There's been structural changes uh, in China in the swine you production can... area, um, using more corn and more meal. So your soybeans and, and corn production are leading the way. Uh, and we believe that that will continue and when combined with everything else that I talked about, um, we see a pretty optimistic future for a, a multitude of years here as, as we try to build this, the stocks back up, um, you know, due to the depletion that happened with the, uh, the increased demand. So, um, you know, it's, it's still early for this year's production, but uh, we're very op optimistic, uh, get the crop in early, have a, a good chance at a, at a strong production and have really strong markets uh, and access to those markets uh, on your behalf. So 
Um, just a, you know, a big contrast from the past years, as Jay noted, and, and uh, we couldn't be more excited uh, you know, to see the market uh, dynamics the way they are. Those dynamics, of course, you know, are not just uh, around the globe, but they translate all the way back into the interior and, and uh, back into the retail business, and, and Rick's going to talk to us about the, the impacts there. So, Rick? Thank you, John. Um, so when you think about the ag retail business, um, you, and you think about the, what's happening today and what opportunities are in the future, you really, you really have to start with this robust ag economy that both Jay and John spoke of. And it's driven by real demand, real global demand, higher prices in grain and oil seeds, and it's driving profitability back to the farm, which drives profitability into ag retail and cr just creates a much more robust ag economy uh, in a way that we haven't seen in at, at least five years or more. So it just creates a sense of optimism and, and uh, you know, an encouragement, at, especially at this time of, of spring planting. And it's just fun to be a part of and energized, energized to be a part of that. I know many of you feel as well, to just feel this optimism. You know, when we look at, at, at country operations in our retail group, you know, we, we look at our asset base, our capabilities, our people, the commitment of our people, the resilience of our people. This is what we were built for. Uh, you know, a robust environment, farmers have, have incentive to plant, farmers have incentive to buy inputs and, and invest into that crop. And we're there ready to serve and, and we're just really excited about that. And then when we think about how we're evolving as a company, and you've heard several examples this morning as we continue to take steps to align our supply chain, create, create more efficiencies, be more effective, capture the true size and scale of, of, of who CHS is. And that's really helping us perform even to higher levels than we've, we've seen in the past. And the goal there is obviously to create more value for our owners, our farmer owners, and, and be able to go forward with a, again, with a sense of, a sense of optimism. So as we look forward, um, and we think about some of the things we want to work on is really around, create. It, it's two things, creating a better customer experience for our farmer customers, creating more value for those farmer customers, bringing the technology tools and, and, the, and the asset base, as well as that strong trusted advisor a position that relies heavily on relationships and take that to a new level. And, and a big part of that is as we organize as an enterprise, and we connect the dots between our core businesses and our retail business to really bring you know, more, more agile system, a speedier system, more effective, more efficient. And that's something to be really excited about. And, and of course, uh, you know, we need to continue to look for ways to reinvest and balance the reinvestment between assets and technology. But our goal and our focus will be to invest in assets and technology that benefits the enterprise in areas that benefit the enterprise to create the most value uh, possible for our owners. So strong ag economy, some exciting things to, you know, to work on as a company with the simple goal of creating more value for our owners. Hopefully they, you, you all pick CHS as our, as our first choice uh, and go forward with a sense of optimism in the ag retail market. And to talk just a little bit more about agronomy specifically, I'll now turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Gary Halverson. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate uh, your comments and your leadership. Um, thank you all for joining us. And as I begin my comments, thank you for your business. Uh, what we do together is vitally important, and we certainly appreciate uh, that connection and the business that we do together. Uh, I'll begin my comments by talking a little bit about the crop nutrients business, uh, as it is planting season. So uh, really, that story was born last fall with a uh, just one heck of a great fall. Uh, a half of the type of volumes we haven't seen for years, uh, maybe 2014 was the last time we'd seen fall volumes uh, this robust and this strong. And that, that emptying of the plants uh, and the emptying of the supply chain really led us to um, just fantastic volumes all through the winter months. As a matter of fact, we, we beat our budget in volume uh, for six of the first seven months of this fiscal year. So thanks again for the business. Really strong performance and, and a big thank you to our crop nutrients team to help support that, that kind of non-traditional activity in those strong volumes. Um, and that was all in preparation for, for spring planting. 
Now, we got to February and saw a, a remarkable cold snap, a record-setting cold snap with cold weather dropping way down to the southern parts of the United States. That shut down a lot of nitrogen production facilities. Um, and in those shutdowns, <clears throat> excuse me, we lost production of about 200,000 tons of urea, about 140,000 tons of UAN that was not going to go to market for spring. That left the, the balance sheet for fertilizer a little bit tight for spring. More price support um, born because of that. And so strong markets, and you see those results in our, our CFN numbers as well, and we anticipate having n nice returns um, here for the rest of the spring months for sure with our CF nit nitrogen uh, business. But, but all in all, the crop nutrients business is, is prepared. Uh, we're recharged and ready for the balance of the fertilizer season and the rest of planting. Uh, and, and again, uh, excited for, for you know, being planting on time for most of the geographies, um, recognizing there's some, some dry areas and some folks that already have seed in the ground, but largely the U.S. will plant on time. And so that speaks well of how CHS will participate in our agronomy team with crop nutrients. The crop protection business, uh, that's, that cold snap also impaired uh, the supply chains and in some cases snapped them. We have uh, somewhere north of 100 brands, brands of crop protection items that are either on allocation um, or somehow supply impaired. Uh, those boil down to about 25 or so active ingredients and our team is really hard at work to make sure that we get you know, the markets that are most active served on time so that through crop care, whether it's herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides, we're doing everything we can to, to make sure this crop is healthy uh, and exceeds the grower's expectations and connects to the cooperative system in a way through those supply plans and forecasts and all the good work that the team does all winter long to deliver now when you need us most. Looking forward in crop protection, I'll tell you, just I could not be more proud of the work our product development team continues to do, um, putting new products, especially in the fertilizer enhancement area, um, working on things that address the four R's, the right product, the right time, the right application, um, and so forth. And so we really view our opportunity in crop protection to be a leader in nutrient enhancement, nutrient efficiency with project products like Trivar. If you haven't heard about it, I'll, I'll talk about it again. Um, it's a patented product uh, that belongs proprietarily to CHS. Um, we're in the second round of testing with the USDA and the EPA right now, and we're proud of that. That testing will lead to a gold star uh, certification, and there are only seven companies and seven products that are still in that in that uh, testing today, there's a lot of folks that have fallen to the wayside. So really pleased with the product development team and what we're, what we're uh, aspiring to be as a leader in, in that nutrient efficiency and nutrient enhancement area. We think that's a real opportunity for all of us in the cooperative system. So thank you again for your business and I'll turn to my colleague, Darren Hunhoff and Energy for his comments. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be with you. Thanks for, uh, again, for, for spending an hour or so of your time virtually with us. When I think about our, our energy business and going into the summer, it's, it's all about the word recovery in terms of the market forces and what we're watching and, and monitoring to ensure we can deliver uh, for you. And I'm glad to say that there's a fair amount of optimism uh, around that. Even the last five to six weeks, we have seen uh, both U.S. gasoline sales and CHS, Senex branded gasoline sales, really just kind of march up um, back to what I would call a more normal level, even a bit past uh, a three-year average. So that's that's exciting momentum. We look for that to continue, uh, as Jay mentioned in, in some of his comments. I also just see the, the supply and demand balance has is, is gotten, frankly, more balanced. Uh, we spent uh, the last couple of quarters building this big uh, kind of oversupply in products like gasoline and diesel fuel and crude oil. And now when we look at those kinds of charts and look at those balances, they're much more in normal ranges. In some regions, we're actually at a bit of a supply deficit. Uh, so for example, I'm really grateful that we got a lot of diesel uh, placed and, and moved to the country uh, through the course of the winter and early spring uh, so that we're well prepared uh, for what's ahead as you, uh, as you hit the fields in, in many regions. Uh, I've also, while watching the lubricants business uh, closely, we really have a nice year going uh, in the area of Senex lubricant sales and, and profitability in that space. At the same time, we have had uh, significant uh, supply chain disruptions, probably not unlike those that, that have affected some of the crop protection space that, that Gary mentioned on the heels of the storms in the Gulf. So we look to continue that momentum in lubricants. We thank you for that business, but we're also really monitoring that supply chain closely uh, to, to make sure we can deliver for you. If I think a little bit further out in less in months and more in years, of course, we are 
continuing to take steps to prepare to really compete well in a world that just frankly has less demand for many of the energy products that, that our system markets, particularly gasoline, but not just that. I feel good about our ability to win in that environment. It's gonna be challenging, but I feel good about our, our ability to win. A couple things we'll continue doing in that new and evolving environment, and namely running safe, reliable operations and doing the investments that are required to continue to run safe, reliable supply chains. Because without that, we really don't have an ability uh, to compete and, and earn your business. So we will continue to do that. Jay mentioned something we are leaning into uh, much harder and that is re-energizing the Senex brand. As a market matures, the fight for market share will get more intense, and that's why we think the timing of the lift program and then the halo image couldn't be better. And we're already seeing some transformative stories of how Senex locations uh, have been re-energized uh, using these programs to enhance both the external image and in many cases completely renovate the, the inside uh, of the stores to have that consumer experience that we need going forward. And then the last thing that I think about in that evolving world is really just an ongoing shift. We've started it already, will be even more intense in this shift, is investing for efficiency and working on efficiency versus capacity growth. It wasn't that long ago, we again would have spoke more about investments in capacity growth in areas like refining. We won't hear a lot of that from us. You'll be hearing us talk about investments that help us get more efficient to ensure we are there for you uh, in this changing environment. And again, it's one I think we can win in and uh, look forward to doing so. With that, I'll turn it back to Jay for, uh, to take your questions and feedback. Thank you, Darren. So um, I think on your screens or in some, some way I'm not familiar with, you're going to see the information on how to submit questions, uh, either text or, or, or email. So please uh, let them come in and, and I'll, I'll, I'll get what I can in the time we have. We are respectful of time. We intend to be uh, at, at go close it at 60 minutes. Um, the questions that have come in while we've been speaking, um, I'm gonna ask Olivia to take these first two. Um, with the significant earnings of most all fertilizer manufacturers, do you anticipate that CFN, which is our investment in CF industries, that's what CFN is, will have higher earnings by the end of fiscal year uh, 2021? So the end of this current fiscal year. Olivia, could you hit that one? Yeah, sure, Jay. Um yeah, I, th I think it's going to be better than we thought it was going to be. Well, that, and I would agree with that. <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm I, I would agree with that. You give a, a forecast. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. It, 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 it does look better than we thought, but the year's not over, is it? The year's not over. Um, let me just follow up with this one, um, Olivia. Why don't you show country ops performance? So that's country operations. That's our retail platform. Uh, as a line item, like we do energy, egg, and nitrogen, now to be clear, energy, while we show it as energy, it's a combination of a lot of businesses within energies. But nevertheless, uh, the question is, why don't we break out country ops? Sure. Well, similar to energy, which has four subsegments, the ag um, business has a number of subsegments beneath it as well. So within there, we have crop nutrients, we have crop protection, we have grain marketing North America, grain marketing international, we have our processing and food ingredients business, and country op operations is in there too. And management obviously sees the breakout, as does the board. So it's just for the segment reporting that we consolidate at a higher level. Thank you, Olivia. So uh, a couple, we were one I'll take. Uh, with limited capital, how will CHS equitably serve the local cooperative as a supply and marketing company while also providing the capital needs of the producer retail operation? So I think what's inside the question is, if we, if we provide capital to country operations, does that limit how we can do it for, for local cooperatives? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just start with, you know, we, we all, ultimately have to make decisions on where capital gets allocated. The board decides ultimately how capital across this company gets, gets allocated. Um, but from the, from the business uh, point of view, yes, we do support country operations. And I get questions from, from country operations stakeholders saying, why don't we get more capital? Why are we investing in the refineries? And then somebody said, well, you, but why are you invest in Myrtle Grove? And th they are, at the end of the day, choices we have to make. Uh, and I would also I would I would say this: every business area has been greatly reduced in capital requests that they brought forward. 
Uh, it was one of several steps that Olivia outlined in, in her presentation that we made looking at what we thought was going to be a difficult year, which in the first six months showed that to be true. So we did cut back on it. Uh, I believe that we can have capital that's appropriate for each business unit uh, and for redemption and equity and patronage uh, decisions that the board makes. Um, but we will be making choices. We'll make, be making choices. We'll, we'll be looking at things of returns and where do we think uh, the returns are going to be? How does it help uh, the people that own us and where the biggest impact is, is there? And in some cases, we will make investments in, in an area like country operations. And in some cases, we're gonna expand Fairmont and we're gonna expand Myrtle Grove. Uh, and the energy refineries take capital. Um, we got to run them in a safe, efficient, as Darren pointed out, uh, way that, that is compliant. And, and so we just frankly have to make those choices, but no business unit uh, has, a, has, a, has a higher starting point. Um, Olivia and I look at it um, all, all through, ultimately make a recommendation to the board of directors who, who, who makes the final decision. Um, but I, I would just say this, that we will we'll, we'll, we'll thread that needle well. We'll thread that needle well, and I, I understand that I could get feedback of somebody's getting more than others, but, but I believe we can do it. Um, this is a question, uh, what market forces are you addressing now and how is your business preparing uh, for the future? So you've, you've heard a lot during the course of, of this about this, but maybe I'll just take the question from an area we really didn't speak a whole lot uh, today on, and that, you know, Darren kind of uh, went there a little bit. The, the, the whole area around sustainability and carbon issues is clearly an area that uh, the world and the country uh, is, is quickly stepping up, uh, and, and so far on the discussion level, um, but ultimately it may lead to legislative uh, steps or regulatory uh, st steps. So we ourselves are, are working, uh, working on that front because it, frankly, it could, it, it could impact almost every business of, of, of CHS and of local cooperatives and, and, and of, of, of producers in that, it, you know, we can, we can talk about fossil fuels and impacts uh, uh, energy segment. We can talk about uh, fertilizer and groundwater issues and the plume off the Gulf of Mexico and that impacts fertilizer and uh, crop protection products business and, and food impacts uh, and, and global grain customers around the world that want to know how that food was produced and where it was produced uh, that really impacts almost every area of this, of this company. I look at it as, as not something to push back on or fight. It is something to embrace and to be part of. Uh, and I look at our role as really bringing, being that seat at the table on behalf of agriculture and farmers. We're, we are the largest cooperative in North America that comes with some responsibility and we take that responsibility and, uh, and we will be at that table. Um, it, it is going to be a topic I think that's gonna be with us forever. Uh, and it is not something that I think we can talk about the pacing of the developments in all these areas, and some might go faster and some might go slower, and some administrations may push harder, but generally, I think this is gonna be work that we as a, as, as, as a society, as a world, is, is going to go forward on, and we, we wanna be part of that. We want agriculture to be part of that. We think there's opportunities from agriculture that go into this. There'll be change. Um, but guess what? We've been doing that for 90 years, and uh, and and we've we've never had such high market shares. Our sales have never been so strong, uh, and I can tell you, just in my 37 years, I've seen great change within our businesses and and how we do business and the volumes and the the units per acre and so many parts of our business that are greatly different than when I started. Uh, and yet our market share has never been higher, our sales never been more. So I think it's something that we could embrace and be part of, uh, and as opposed to push back, fight. That's, I don't think that's a winning hand. Uh, a a follow-up question to that uh, was submitted. Uh, CO2 sequestration from no-till egg has potential. Worry about large companies getting in the middle of this would seem a good opportunity for our own co-op CHS to represent us and take the lead. I agree. I agree with the questioner. I think this is going to be an opportunity. I think it's one of the ways that for agriculture, this could be, uh, this could be an opportunity. 
I also have to say, you know, when we when we think about these opportunities, though, uh, in in every area that that uh, that I've spoken about so far, we also got to think about scalability and the fact that these get developed in a way that have longevity uh, and can serve markets that are bigger than you know one selling to one. Uh, or just a limited number of buyers. I mean, you think about carbon sequestration and the issue and the, and the opportunities that could come from hundreds of thousands of sellers and hundreds of thousands of buyers. Uh, so that's the scale we need to think about. And, and so that brings you to thinking about these commodities on regulated exchanges just to give people confidence that if they're buying something, it's there, it's secure, it's liquid, uh, and it's real. Uh, and, and, you know, things aren't yet in that period of development, but that's, that's some of the aspects we're bringing to it. So yes, we think CHS can, pro can provide, um, you know, a role, particularly as, as this is beginning, but we also got to think longer term and how things have scalability. If a world is going to be buying carbon credits, if a world is going to be buying that, then they've got to be done in a way that gives the world and its stakeholders confidence that they're there, they're going to be there, and if somebody shows them on their balance sheet, they're, they're, they're liquid and they're valued correctly. Uh, so there's just gonna be lots that's gonna go into that. I think it's gonna be exciting. I think there's gonna be great opportunities for agriculture, but you, have, you also have to think about steps five and six, or years 10 and 12, you know, down the road at the same time as we're thinking about the opportunities today. Um, but I, I agree with the questioner. I agree with the questioner. Um, Darren, one for you. Um, how are you assessing the effectiveness of the new analytics of the transportation uh, department? So transportation division uh, hauls liquids, uh, has a pressure fleet for anhydrous as well as propane, and that is, uh, is, is an area that D Darren works closely with and oversees. So Darren, I'll look to you. Yeah, sure, thanks, Jay. And, and, and you know, I understand that the word transportation can cover a lot of things, whether it be the truck transportation in the area of, uh, of liquids that, that Jay referenced, but I also know we've got rail transportation, we've got barge transportation, and we are raising the bar on analytics on, on all of those modes, all of those modes. When I think about it specifically for the truck transportation that, that I get to be a part of, you know, I, I think it's some pretty fundamental things. You know, how are our on-time orders and what are our cycle times from the time a customer places an order to the time it's delivered? Now, there's certainly lots of factors in that, as you all know, uh, through the supply chain. But at the end of the day, how is our cycle time, given the conditions we might have? And those real-time analytics allow us to see that and, and improve our performance over time is the expectation. The, the second area would be on asset utilization. Uh, trucking is obviously an asset heavy business and the more we can use our own assets, our own drivers, our own trucks, our own trailers versus third parties, our owner operators in some cases, um, typically the better we can perform and the better return we can get. So those would be two areas, kind of cycle times to order and asset utilization are ways we're really raising the bar on analytics so that we can continuously improve and, and apply those re lean principles uh, as we go forward. Thanks, Darren. Um, maybe I'll ask uh, Olivia to come come back, and 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 Dan. Sure, maybe you would weigh into. Is the question is when will CHS return to issuing qualified stock in, in, instead of non qualified? Uh, just to, to 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 set up for the question, CHS has been issuing non qualified really. Uh, I think since the 199s were available for us to use, but. Um, but when do you see that changing, uh, Olivia? And, and Dan, if you have any comments on behalf of the board, please. Sure, thanks, Jay. So, um, and you know, I'll start by saying that equity management decisions are in the purview of the board. Um, but uh, as long as the cooperative system can avail of those 199 Cap A or DPAD, the Domestic Production Activities Tax Deduction, um, I expect that we will continue to issue non-qualifieds um, and we will have to evaluate as tax provisions change. So we're continually looking at the most tax, tax effective um, structure. Um, those DPAD deductions are, are due to sunset in 2025. Good, thank you, Olivia. Dan, anything from the board? Yeah, I just maybe a follow up. If you look a little deeper into the question, maybe you would see that uh, there's some concern sometimes with the non-qualified equity that we're issuing. 
but uh, I want to rest uh, just to make sure and reinforce again that this uh, non-qualified equity is in our pool of revolvement and it's revolved on the normal process that we use just like the qualified equity. So uh, just to verify that we are mm -hmm. continuing to do that. Good. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The last uh, question I'll take is, as our time is, is, is at time, and I won't even take the question, but it's a terrific question, and, um, and because, it, because you're seeing it in our results, Olivia referred to it, uh, you've seen it in our printed materials, and the question is, can you go into detail on why REN pricing, um, redu renewable identification number pricing, has drastically increased? It's a terrific question. It's incredibly impactful for our income statements. And unfortunately, this is not a question that's easily done here. So uh, what I am going to offer to the questioners, since I don't know who, who submitted it, is, um, is either call Darren Hunhoff uh, or send him an email, and he can connect with you to, to have that conversation. And I'm not trying to, but it just takes quite a bit of time to talk through uh, but it's an excellent and absolutely appropriate question. Um, but I think that might be the best way that gives Darren a chance to listen to, to you and it just takes some engagement back and forth to, I think, to, to do it justice. Uh, and Olivia, maybe, I guess it's, it's probably a lesson for us in terms of is there a way that we can try to get that topic into, into something we can speak to uh, in, in these settings too because it is having a drastic impact on us and... Uh, and it's very impactful for our income statement. So I appreciate where the question comes from. So as we are wrapping up today to be respectful of, of, of time, I want to thank all of you for, for joining us today. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for your support for CHS and for your support of the businesses, uh, for your support of the board of directors. Uh, and, and just thank you for the business. Thank you for everything. Really looking forward to a great second half of the year. Not an easy year. Uh, it's not. But we knew that going into it. But it's really nice to see the momentum coming back. Um, you know, farmers doing better with commodity prices lifting. Uh, the, the, the U.S., production of agricultural products is, is, is now what the world wants, and that's right up our alley, uh, everyone. That's right up our alley. So really just great optimism going, going, going forward for the rest of the year and going into 2022. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for the business, and we'll talk again soon. <laughs>